Okay, well, everyone, to the final parallel session of Sustainable Earth 2021. And so this particular session is on carbon offsetting. Uh, and yesterday in um, one of the workshops, carbon offsetting came up as a particular theme. And this is the workshop delivered by the Plymouth Net Zero Carbon Action Group. Um, and in fact, as um, a, a set of larger organisations across Plymouth, we realised that in order to achieve net zero as organisations, um, the members have identified that once everything they've done to reduce carbon, some level of carbon offsetting will be required. And so we are keen as members of that action group to try and find solutions locally uh, that are verifiable. And so it's with great pleasure that we have two speakers that are exploring what this really means in practice. And so the two speakers we have today are Dr. Paul Lunt, who is Associate Professor in Environmental Science here at the University of Plymouth, and Rob Passmore, who is Commercial Lead for the North Devon Biosphere Foundation. So without further ado, please can I ask Paul to come to the stage and talk about the ad applications of the Woodland and Peatland Codes. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this um, session. So as um, ha has uh, been um, suggested, I'm going to uh, talk about um, carbon sequestration, in particular in relation to woodlands and, and peatlands, and uh, in particular the, uh, the carbon um, Carbon farming, I suppose, is what we um, we could we could call this. Paul, would you like me to share your presentation for you? Um, I think I'm okay. I just had a little bit of technical issue there. Providing we're um, providing this is um, allowing me to um, to move on. You're still um, on is that slide one at the moment, and you're not in. Okay, full that's mode. great. So I'm going to continue then. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, folks. A little bit of technical problem there. So um, basically, I'm just going to I'm going to take you on a, a journey from um, global to um, to local. So we're going to have a, a chat about global levels of carbon sequestration and um, rates of carbon uptake by um, by woodlands. And um, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of the um, of the woodland carbon code, and then move on to talking about release of carbon from our peatlands, which is a major issue both globally and in the UK. And then we're going to talk about this relative um, relatively new development, the Carbon Code, um, with the first projects coming online in 2018, and talk a little bit about, about what's required uh, for the Carbon Code, and then have a think about the important considerations which result from, um, from carbon offsets. So that's the kind of idea. Um, I'm going to start off, though, by talking a little bit about our major um, biomes and how things have changed. Um, due to humans over, um, over recent years. So we've got on the right-hand screen there at the top, we've got the major biomes on Earth as they would have been when they were determined just by um, climate back in the 1700s. And then uh, within that map, we've got uh, pink and red areas. Now the pink and red areas are those areas which are either intensively or extensively managed for agriculture and um, crops. And if we look down Wait, to can the I bottom, interrupt for a second, just just to let you know that you're not actually on full screen with your slides, so it's difficult oh, to see. Okay, just put us onto full screen, then that would be great. Okay, that's great. So we've got down at the bottom end of the the um, right hand corner there. Um, 
the earth or the biomes as they appear now. Now, 30% of our um, carbon that's been released in total uh, into the atmosphere has come from land use change. So forest clearance and drainage of wetlands in, um, in particular. So you can see in the new world in the Americas, we've got um, lots of the red and the pink area there is where we've got extensive drainage of wetlands through into um, Europe and uh, Southeast Asia and Australia, lots of the kind of uh, uh, pink and, um, and red areas there. So representing a major change, we've effectively changed the vegetation makeup of our own planet and altered that uh, carbon sequestration. Now over on the right hand, over on the left hand side of the screen, you can see the iconic uh, Alan Keeling curve. So this is a curve that goes back to 1957 and shows atmospheric CO2 levels and how they've increased over the, um, over the decades up until um, present time. So going from less than 300 uh, parts per million up to over 100 and, uh, 410 parts per million uh, present day. When I first saw this as an undergraduate, in, as an environmental biology undergraduate, I was actually blown away, not by the fact that we were um, changing the Earth's atmospheric concentrations at that time, um, but more by the fact that, um, because at that particular time, the 1980s, uh, uh, climate change wasn't a concern. But what really impressed me is when I looked at this little curve on the um, top left-hand corner here. So this shows, uh, the uh, annual changes in CO2 in the atmosphere at Mauna Lua, this site uh, where Alan Keeling has, has recorded on uh, in Hawaii, and it shows the um, first bit of the curve. Basically, shows the um, the inward or sorry, the outward um, respiring of carbon back to the atmosphere from our biosphere and from our um, soils. So it's kind of like the the outward breath of um, of um, planet Earth. And then when you've got the summer um, and spring and summer periods, we get uptake of carbon from the atmosphere in the process of photosynthesis and drawdown of that carbon uh, back into, to the, um, into the plant and, and biosphere. This exchange annually on planet Earth represents about 120 or so gigatons. Now, 120 gigatons, difficult to, to visualize that, but that's about 15% of the atmospheric CO2 concentrations that are exchanged each year on planet Earth through the process of photosynthesis. A, a massive amount, a staggering amount, um, and it really did show me uh, the connectiveness between the biosphere and the atmosphere at that particular time. Um, So in terms of the global importance of woodlands and peatlands for carbon sequestration, uh, globally forests absorb about 16 billion metric tonnes of CO2 uh, per year, uh, providing a carbon sink that absorbs about, or a net carbon sink of about um, 7.6 billion metric tonnes. It would be higher if it weren't for the fact that we've got forest degradation and forest clearance, so about eight billion metric tonnes of CO2 are released each year from degradation and forest clearance, uh, particularly in the, um, in the tropics. The tropics are really important from the viewpoint of their, um, of their forest systems. On the right hand side of the screen there, you can see an image that I took from Borneo back in 2010. And I think it kind of, it shows the biomass of the forest because this picture is taken from a rickety platform at about 30 meters above the forest, looking down onto the canopy from an emergent tree. And a, a hectare, of um, land in a, a tropical forest will contain many hundreds of tons of carbon in wood fiber. Um, that carbon, which would otherwise be in the atmosphere if that uh, forest was felled. So really, really important uh, in, indeed. Um, but even more important in many ways, because it's a much more intensive store of carbon on our, are our peatlands. So our peatlands cover just three to 4% of the world's um, surface area, but they hold some 615 gigatons of carbon. Now, just to give you a bit of an idea, this is almost as much as the total amount of um, carbon that's stored in the atmosphere as, as CO2 in just three or four percent of the world's um, surface. So really, really important and intensive um, carbon stores. Um, 
And that carbon is equivalent to about 21% of the global total soil carbon stocks. So really important. In, in relation to the forest systems, that's twice the carbon storage of all our, um, our forest biomass um, combined. So let's have a little, little look at, at a little bit closer to home now in the UK. Um, tree planting and peatland restoration are two key strands in the government strategy to reach net zero uh, by uh, 2050. And the UK is committed to increase tree planting to 30,000 hectares uh, annually by, um, by 2025. So this is going to increase the forest cover um, to at least 17% of the UK's land area by uh, 2050. Uh, together with an, an improved woodland management, this will uh, sequester some 14 million tonnes of CO2 each year. Uh, just to give a little bit of perspective for that, it sounds like a large number, it is a large number and really important for us to achieve that. But uh, the uh, annual uh, CO2 emissions in 2019 uh, for uh, for the UK were some 450 million tonnes of CO2, um, so a small, a small part in comparison. Uh, in order to achieve this, the Committee for Climate Change estimates that one-fifth of the UK farmland should be used to, um, to tackle uh, the issue of um, climate change. Now, before I go on, I just want to kind of explain something. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, actually, when you're working in, in this area of climate change and carbon sequestration because of the units. Sometimes you'll see them expressed as carbon um, and other times you'll see them more typically uh, or commonly expressed as, as CO2. Uh, and, and CO2 in particular with a little E at the end of them, like you can see on the screen here, which means equivalent. So CO2, although it's the most important uh, greenhouse gas, is um, is not the only one. Of course, we have things like um, methane, which is a much more potent uh, global warming um, gas, and therefore we have this kind of equivalence. So you'll see that. Um, sometimes the numbers don't quite make sense because it depends if they're expressed in carbon or CO2. Okay, let's have a, um, a little bit of a chat about some facts and figures associated with um, woodland carbon capture then. So um, in relation to the woodland carbon coal, Projects can include both natural regeneration, which is something that we're working on at, here at the university, uh, which creates a much more kind of natural woodland feel, a little bit of a slower uptake um, of carbon, at least initially, but um, there are lots of wins uh, in terms of biodiversity enhancement. Uh, so we're looking, we're looking at that, but also more typically, of course, it's a um, planting uh, or indeed a combination of both of them. So the woodland uh, code, uh, values that are produced by the Forestry Commission estimate that on average a native British woodland, so our broadleaf trees, will capture about three to four hundred tonnes of CO2 per hectare in the um, first 50 years uh, following plantation or following the um, fencing, deer fencing or enclosure of, of an area. This equates to about seven tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year for the first 50 years. Uh, so potential to get payment on that, um, on that seven tonnes um, per hectare. If you extend the, um, the period, um, then um, trees, once many trees at least, once they get above 50 years, you tend to start to get a slight slowing down in, in the uptake from that initial surge. And the value then of um, annual value of um, sequestered carbon drops to 4.5 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year over the 100 years. Now, we'll come back to this a little bit later on, but current prices for, um, for one tonne of CO2 sowed on the uh, market uh, registry it is um, just uh, uh, five to 15 um, pounds uh, per tonne, which is uh, a relatively low value, um, at least presently. However, I should just say, before I go on to talk a little bit more about the, um, the carbon code, that the, um, the government has announced some four, uh, 640 million um, as part of a um, capital grants for peatland and, and, and woodland restoration, um, which is a, 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 um, an added advantage, I suppose, for, for taking these, um, these systems forward. Okay, in, in relation to, to payments then for, um, for the woodland um, code, 
it's relatively well developed now for for woodlands where we've got about 300 or so projects that are that are um are um validated and registered um what you need to do basically is register with the forestry commission within two years of um of plantation and then um you can predict your carbon capture using woodland carbon models so uh, quite typically um, you would need to know your your species and there are lookup tables that enable you to determine what you would uh, expect from the, the particular trees on a particular site and geographical location. Then you prepare a, a, a project design document or PDT D, uh, and this is then needed to be validated by um, an accredited certified body. Um, and then you get verification of the, um, the carbon units after five years. They start off as a um, issue units and then uh, switch to to uh, full um, carbon uh, code units uh, once you've got that verification process out of the way um, and you need to basically um, record and verify every 10 years from from that point um, uh, onwards there are some uh, slight complications to it in that you get a deduction of carbon emissions from site preparation so particularly where you've got a highly organic soil and you're looking at, um, at the actual planting process itself, that can release carbon um, from the um, soil. It does depend on your, um, on your kind of starting line, your baseline for carbon. Um, arable soils, of course, with low carbon levels, there are potential wins there in the long term from converting to, to woodland. And if um, during the process of um, recording and, um, and uh, verifying, you may, um, you're not achieving the um, the, the goals, the predicted goals, then corrective action is required um, in order to meet those. From year 15 onwards, the carbon capture needs to be based on actual tree measurements, which is uh, um, going out into the field basically, and reporting is required by the, um, the Woodland um, Carbon Code. Right, I just want to talk about um, the issue of um, emissions from uh, peatlands before we go on to talk about the peatland uh, code because in the case of peatlands it's it's um, emissions reduction that we're mainly looking at so we're looking at the winds from reducing um, co2 which would be released to to the atmosphere uh, and we've got a real a real problem because um of the world's 175 peatland nations the uk is is amongst the um highest emitter of co2 from damaged peatlands i think we're about number 17 on that um, that list uh, and best estimates is that the uk has some uh, 2.3 million hectares of blanket bog and raised bark, bark of which uh, 80 percent or 1.8 million hectares is in is in a damaged state um with only about 13 percent of england's peatlands in a near natural state so uh, this uh, particular figure here from Natural England 2010 shows the um, state of England's peatlands and the red area, the red is bad basically. So the reds are areas where we can expect um, emissions of carbon to the atmosphere. The greens are where there is, um, there is uh, peatlands in a fairly good condition. And this takes into account not only the upland blanket bog uh, peatlands, but also the lowland uh, fen systems in places like East Anglia and Somerset. You can see here in, in, um, in Dartmoor in the southwest, uh, Dartmoor's in a relatively good condition with quite a lot of the green showing there. But in total, England's peatlands are estimated to emit about 11 million tonnes of CO2 um, per year, um, which I is a real issue for So what can we do? What can we do to um, to fix this problem? Well, peatland restoration measures such as the blocking of um, drainage ditches. A lot of the emissions are where we've got blocked drainage emission, uh, ditches and um, an oxygen infiltration into the surface of the peat causing oxidation. Uh, we've got restoration of gully erosion, as shown in the picture there, where we've got bare eroding peat in a um, in a in, in one of the dendritic one of the drainage channels, which is uh, releasing um, peat further down in, into the catchment. Uh, Reprofiling of hags, where we've got standing areas of, of peat with bare sides, which are um, eroding. Um, 
We can do um, seeding of Maya species onto bare peat areas. You can see some of this going on here in the cotton grass behind the, um, the wooden blocks in this particular gurry, or indeed where we've got the absence of sphagnum or bog moss, we can look at the reintroduction of, um, of sphagnum onto the um, bare peat to turn these peatlands from what are um, quite often sources of greenhouse gases to, um, to sinks. And then we need to be thinking about appropriate management. So the emissions um, inventory suggests that about 150,000 hectares of peat have so far been restored in the UK out of a target of, of some um, 2 million uh, hectares by, by um, 2040. So in relation to the peatland code, it's a little bit more complicated and under development, but the government's aim is, is to have a registry, the same registry, the market registry for both um, woodlands and, and peatland systems. Um, so the project needs to be registered and then we need a um, site survey to work out um, the condition of the site and then the completion of the peatland code uh, documentation. Quite external val validation to ensure that there's uh, compliance. Can you, and can also you um, then uh, you can secure funding and start the, um, the actual restoration activity and similar to, to the woodland uh, carbon code verification of carbon savings after five years and every 10 years from thereafter but the actual uh, documentation can be quite involved particularly the the condition assessments uh, which need to be carried out in the ground with mapping of areas which are eroding eroding and bare peat areas and drainage ditches and channels and etc which unfortunately is, is um, often quite involved for for at least for farmers to carry that out paul um, paul can you can you hear me yes um i'm afraid that's your time pretty much up so i'm going to bring paul back onto the screen as well to join you okay that's fine a bit of a rocky start there that's fine, Paul. Um, no problem. Um, thanks ever so much for that. And um, I don't, don't know if you want to just kind of wrap up in terms of um, just just where you are now and then and then we'll move on to Rob. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, uh, one of the things that I was going to talk about is the fact that um, um, there are problems with this system. It's in the kind of development stage. Uh, we shouldn't be using offsets as a um, as a. Uh, as a justification, they need to be um, part of the suite that, of, um, of solutions that we're, we're, um, we're looking at. And we need um, some uh, easier ways of actually, um, particularly for the peatlands, of identifying the amounts of carbon loss. That's great. Thanks ever so much. And, and you'll be pleased to see, Paul, that we've had um, a whole host of questions for you. Um, so we'll try and squeeze those in at the end. So thanks ever so much for that. Um, and so now we're going to move straight on to uh, the next presentation. Um, so, Rob, can I uh, ask you to come to the stage, please? Thanks, Thank Paul. you very much. Afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Rob Passmore. I am the commercial lead at the North Devon Biosphere. Um, and I want to talk to you this afternoon a little bit about two initiatives specifically that we're, we're looking to launch. Uh, one, the Natural Capital Impact Fund and a natural capital marketplace as well, um, which we'll talk through. But first, I wanted to just give a little bit of information about the UNESCO biosphere, as it can um, it can be confused with biomes from the Eden Project um, and, and other things as well. So um, the UNESCO biosphere is a designation from the United Nations. Um, it marks uh, an ecosystem or a habitat that has uh, a unique and special characteristic that should be um, preserved. Um, there are over 700 um, reserves around the world. Um, they include the Hawaiian Islands, the Serengeti, and together the network makes up over 5% of the Earth's uh, total surface. Um, zooming into Devon, uh, North Devon um, has a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve. It is the first and one of only three biospheres in England. Um, and it covers 30% of Devon. Uh, so it touches both of our national parks. Uh, it's down past Oakhampton and 12 miles out past Lundy as well. Um, a land-based and a marine uh, biosphere reserve. Um, 
we've been fortunate enough to host two of the four pioneer programs that were central to the development of uh, the government's 25 year environment plan. Uh, one focused on land and one on the marine context. Um, and through that and a lot of other uh, research work, um, you know, we are becoming uh, nationally recognized um, as an area with a specialism in natural capital. Um, the Biosphere Foundation um, is a charity and a CIC um, that is associated with the Biosphere Reserve, and this is the mission of the foundation. So what we're trying to do is to create an economy uh, that is based on natural capital, generating over 20% of the Southwest GDP by creating, testing, scaling and sharing new innovative economic models that not only uh, deliver significant environment uh, benefit, but also um, uh, social benefits as well. Um, it's our belief that good intentions need to be combined with the right economics in order to uh, deliver significant impact. And that's the model that we really want to take. Uh, we view the biosphere very much as the epicenter for the work that we do, rather than being a limitation for it. All of the work that we do is science based. Um, and we've got good relationships with Plymouth, um, Exeter and other universities. Um, and um, yeah, it's a test bed. So what we're trying to do is discover models and then roll them out um, into, into other areas. Um, so I'll do a bit of good news, bad news um, before looking at the solutions that we've come up with just to frame the situation um, as we see it. So we see the good news, the government's commitment to, to net zero by 2050 is a very um, positive policy indicator. Um, over 50% of the FTSE 100 have also now put corporate net zero targets in um, on or before 2050. Um, the ESG investment market, ESG stands for environmental, societal and, go and governance, uh, but it's sustainable and it, um, ethical investment market is, is, it is really changing now uh, with a lot of pension funds and other organizations migrating away from fossil fuels towards investments that have um, a, uh, an environmental or social benefit associated with them, uh, which is a very positive uh, development. Um, the COVID response has highlighted that we are able to change rapidly uh, when faced with um, significant problems, which I think should encourage us coming into the scale of change that needs to happen with regards to the climate. And there's a significant opportunity here for job creation. Um, and this is something that I think is really relevant for the Southwest. Um, in terms of the bad news, um, we've got to stick to 1.5 degrees maximum growth, which means significant greenhouse gas, uh, not only reductions, but also sequestering. So capturing it back out of the environment, um, out of the atmosphere to do that. 20 uh, or the 2020s is very much the uh, decade for action. Uh, many are saying 50% needs to be done by 2030. I would actually say it's, um, as I know others have too, closer to 75% that needs to be done by 2030. Um, and um, those are the easy yards. Um, it'll be the decade after that that will be hard when we're uh, really looking around for how we can bring the remaining down to a net zero. Um, and we're currently off plan. So the shaded area on this chart highlights um, the curve that the UK should be on. And this is from the um, Committee on Climate Change, um, all parliamentary committee. Um, and it highlights that we, we're, we're not changing fast enough um, and highlights the urgency that is needed, not only from government, but also from NGOs and the private sector too. Um, in terms of nature, this is the, the second area, I think, that's really struggling at the moment. Whilst 50% of the world's economic output depends on nature, nearly 80% of species are threatened. Um, and it's really at the kind of nexus of um, climate and, uh, and nature uh, that these problems are existing. So, you know, where we damage one, we damage the other uh, more often than not. And where we address one, Quite often, if we're doing it through nature based solutions, we address the other um, as well. Um, and the last um, problem before we can turn the corner and start looking at some solutions is, is economic problems. Um, there is significant supply side issues 
with investment coming into nature-based projects. Uh, what I mean by that is there's a lot of interest from large um, organizations such as HSBC, Barclays, Triodos, Aviva and others who have funds to invest in nature-based pro uh, projects, but they are blocked currently because of these problems. Um, a lack of aggregation of projects up to an investment scale, high bespoke one-off projects um, and transaction costs. Um, there's weak first mover advantage, advantages in the market at the moment to incentivize entrepreneurialism. Um, and there's a lack of models to, um, to replicate um, through what's, what's going on. Uh, within the Southwest, there's, you know, there's a real problem where we're surrounded by such environmental beauty and wealth. Um, sorry, I don't know why it keeps flicking onto the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of environmental richness um, that's surrounded by us, but that really hasn't translated into uh, community wealth. Um, and we've got some of the worst social mobility figures in, in the UK um, through that. So it'd be good if we could find a way to sustainably unlock that um, and create more community wealth for our, our residents. Um, and we've got a real risk of not capturing uh, the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution, which is worth a look, um, the, the, the project on this around circular economy, the green economy, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we believe is the kind of key question, the key challenge that we need to address. Um, and it is how can we sustainably leverage our natural capital to do six things? Number one, crowd in very large amounts of private investment. Um, and remove those blockers. Number two, stimulate um, high levels of new jobs to be created within this sector. Number three, regenerate nature and biodiversity locally. Number four, sequester significant amounts of carbon through new natural programs. Five, relocalize our communities through self-financing economic models that re-empowers local communities. Um, and number six creates replicatable models that can be pushed out elsewhere um, a, 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 and pushed around um, to other areas. So our view is, yes, we can do that by, by launching three programs. And these are the three programs the Biosphere Foundation is in the process of bringing to market. They, they largely fit three things. Number one, funding new projects. Number two, placing those funds into the projects themselves. And number three, measuring the outputs of those of those projects too. Sorry, is someone someone clicking next on the I, I, I seem to be kind of someone someone else seems to be driving the presentation. No? Okay, good. Um, so if I just look at sorry, technical issues here too. Um, if I hang on. Kate, is that is something going on here with with remote control of the, the presentation because I'm not pressing buttons. No, you're you're fully sharing at your end, so it's nothing I'm doing, I'm afraid. Okay, I might just drop out of screen share to just show it like this then at that point. Okay. Yeah, very strange. Sorry. Okay, so um the impact fund. So this is the structure of the impact fund. So the biosphere is in the process of launching a new 50 million pound private investment impact fund. Um, we are uh, looking to launch this to uh, investment markets in May 2022. Um, it's a blended fund, which means it combines part public funding and part um, uh, private funding. Uh, and those funds will be exclusively focused on nature based projects um, and investing into those projects across three different areas. Um, Five million will be um, earmarked for innovation funding. Uh, uh, 40 million will be earmarked for scaling proven models that are generated. Five million for replicating um, and share, knowledge sharing the models elsewhere. Uh, we've got two technical advisors that are really best in class um, within the UK, Investing for Good, who is going to uh, provide uh, fund management uh, technical expertise for us. Um, they're a leader in social impact investment and Vivid Economics, who supported the Disgupta review uh, on biodiversity um, and is um, a, a subsidiary of McKinsey Consulting. 
Um, it's going to be investing across six different areas, ranging from forest, oceans, land, habitat, climate and catchments. And the aim is that it creates um, natural capital assets which generate public goods, um, but also uh, outcomes such as carbon offsets, biodiversity offsets that can be marketed and sold to generate a return on the fund um, itself. Um, I'm going to try if I can go full screen on this one again, just because the next screen does kind of show it. Now oh, it's very, I don't know why, it's just like a key is pressed all the way through. Um, the, the marketplace um, is, uh, sorry, in terms of the status of this, so we're, uh, we've secured funding for the initial work um, and we've got a number of additional um, elements of funding to get to investment readiness, uh, both through um, the Environment Agency and Devon County Council that we're currently open for. Uh, the marketplace, um, we've secured funding from the Environment Agency to support development over the first two years of this project, and we're due to be launching this publicly in the next six weeks. Um, the marketplace really is a way to place project funds into initiatives um, in, uh, out with landowners um, at, through delivery partners. So we're working with uh, both national parks with this, Devon Wildlife Trust, West Country Rivers Trust, to implement um, these projects. We provide the project funding for them in exchange for the stacked ecosystem outcomes. So for example, it could be a woodland creation that generates carbon offsets, biochar and um, biodiversity net gain um, offsets, um, which are then brought back into the fund and are validated against the standards that Paul was talking about. So the woodland code, peatland code um, and the likes. Um, to create products that can then be marketed and sold to uh, customers. Um, and it's through that, that transaction cycle that then creates um, the revenue for, for, for that. Um, in terms of the standards um, and the asset classes that we're looking at, um, we talked about, Paul talked about the Woodland Code and the Peatland Code. Those are established, if not emerging standards, um, but there are others that are starting to appear as well. Um, and what we're looking to do is work based on science and third party uh, validation. But this is a moving feast and things are developing quite fast. So there's emerging standards for uh, salt marsh, for example. Uh, there's some blue carbon initiatives that are going on as well to validate that. Um, and Gold Standard, a US organization, is looking um, or has launched a um, methodology framework for soil carbon um, as well. Quick look at the um, uh, what the site will look like, just to give you a, an idea. It kind of, it, you know, we're, we're leveraging the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, through the relationship with the with the United Nations. It highlights the asset classes that can be purchased um, and the uh, the code that it's been validated um, against. And as I say, we're working with established asset classes like carbon offsets and emerging. Um, asset classes like kilometres of river restoration um, uh, with the Environment Agency and, and others. Um, last, uh, two minutes to go, OK? That's fine. Yeah, lovely. Um, so one last project. It's really important to ensure that we get strong monitoring, reporting and verification of outcomes. Uh, we've got another project, the third project called the Smart Biosphere, which is funded by um, Heart the Southwest and Southwest Water uh, to help uh, leverage technology and really digital twin technology and uh, earth observation to help to validate outcomes from these kind of programs. Um, this project is underway and we're due to launch um, the applications and a network at a catchment scale in Northern Devon um, this financial year. Um, so solution design, I'm going to fly straight past because of time. And I just want to mention um, a couple of things about carbon offsetting. So th this is a model that I think is becoming more and more familiar, that um, an emitter comes up with a strategy to reduce their carbon footprint and quickly realise that there is a residual amount that they will need to offset. Um, certainly, this is the case for a lot of corporates. I know the Environment Agency has recently put out um, a similar situation as well, saying that they're going to need to offset 55% of their um, carbon footprint. Um, the the offsets, you know, what the, the, 
yeah, the aim, sorry, this, I don't know why my computer keeps just going on to the next slides. Um, our recommendation is not only to set um, a target for net zero and an iterative roadmap for internal carbon reduction. This is not a replacement for reducing internal carbon footprints. It is as well as the hard yards that need to be done internally to actually meet net zero. And that purchasing of, net, of offsets needs to be done responsibly. And we believe that they need to be UK based so that we're not exporting carbon. They need to be largely nature based so that they're leveraging, leveraging natural habitat. Uh, they need to focus on community wealth building so it's not making people rich. Um, they need to be third party verified and have provenance tracking them back to source. Um, and this is just a favorite quote of mine. If only I could get my presentation to stay on the same slide. God damn it. Um, which is hope is an emotion with its sleeves rolled up. I think we have to stay positive, but we need to really work hard on this together um, to, uh, to to get to the, the net zero that we're, we're all hoping for. Um, as I say, it's not a case of offsetting, pushing the can down the road, more a case of a necessary dynamic to get to a genuine real net zero. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thanks, Rob. Um, Sorry about the PowerPoint gremlins. Yeah, there are, there are gremlins all around, so don't worry about that. One of the inevitable things when you're working with live and computers, I think that's just one of the things we have to know about. So I think we've got time for, for, for one or maybe two questions. Um, and if I, if I ask the question that David asked, um, the effectiveness of purchasing carbon offsets seems to be very controversial. But any thoughts on buying offsets um, relating to um, individual carbon footprints? So what can individuals do? Any, any thoughts about what individuals can do to offset their own carbon footprint? Well, I think individuals and organisations, first of all, need to think about um, reducing their, their emissions before. So this is the last, the last kind of um, stage. And I think particularly for the land use sector and nature-based solutions, uh, we have large emissions from our, our um, land use at the moment via agriculture and, and, and other things. And I think, you know, hopefully the Woodland Carbon Code and Peatland Carbon Code will enable a little bit of a rebalance of that within the, um, in the sector yes. rather than, so it's getting its own house in order rather necessarily than it being sold on, on, on the market would, would be my kind of take. That's brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um, anything to add, Rob? Yeah, um, I, I agree. You've got to look internally first. And then when you look externally, you've got to look for strong certification. So you've got to look for um, additionality, making sure that it's additional, that there isn't leakage, which basically means that the reductions are being replaced by some other activity that's taking its place. Um, and if we can, making them nature based. Um, you know, I think is a, is a great way to, um, to to sequester the carbon and also deal. It's that nexus, dealing with one and the other at the same time. Climate and nature, I think, will double down on the um, additional benefits. That's brilliant. And apologies, everyone, that uh, we, we've got a huge number of different questions and things. And sorry, we, we've run out of time. Um, but please do carry on the kind of conversations and discussion on the discussion board, um, which you'll find on the homepage. Okay, so thanks ever so much to Rob and Paul for their presentations. And we now have a break um, and the marketplace sessions start at 10 past two. So please um, make your, have a, grab a cup of tea and then make your way to the marketplace session. Thanks ever so much.